Hello and welcome to another episode of My Pocket Psych, the podcast all about the psychology of the workplace. I'm Dr. Richard McKinnon, chartered psychologist and coach, and I am joined as ever by my co-host, Pilar or T. Pilar, how are things with you? Good, a little bit cold, <laughs> but you know, it is December in uh, the Western uh, North Hemisphere, so what to do, what to do. All good mm. though. We shouldn't be surprised, but we are every year that it suddenly gets cold. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So this um, is our 150th episode. Congratulations. Well, and to you. Um, yes, but I'm not here for every episode for 150. You are. So well done. <laughs> it is. I mean, anyone who has a podcast or who listens to podcasts knows that um, it's not easy to get to 150. So yeah, congratulations. It's It's been nice. It's been fun. We'll talk about that in a minute because I do want to have a bit of a review and that's the theme of today, actually, the benefits of looking backwards to see what we can learn from it. But before we dive into that, I've got a few bits of news to share with our listeners. So um, it is late notice, but this episode will be out in time that our online community, worklifepsych.club, we have our December meetup, and that is on December 13th at 1 p.m. UK time. It's completely free to members, and if you're not a member, you can sign up in five minutes by visiting worklifepsych.club. And the reason I wanted to squeeze it into the news for this episode is that it's all about planning for 2024. So we will be having a little bit of a look at how you can do a retrospective over your year, but we're also going to look at elements of goal setting, elements of habit formation, and making the year what you want it to be. There's an awful lot of messaging at this time of year about make it your best year ever. And I, I want to take that pressure off. <laughs> it's make it the year you want it to be. And maybe it's a year of doing less. Maybe it's a year of just maintaining things. Or maybe you think 2024 is going to be a big year for you. Or maybe you're anticipating a lot of change. Whatever it is, it's a really good idea to start thinking about that and planning that in advance of January 1st, when it can seem like it then it slips out of your hand. So December 13th, 1 p.m. UK time, you can sign up at worklifepsych.club and it's totally free. On a different note, um, I've been asked to present at a coaching psychology conference. Now I'm giving you lots of notice. It's not till April 26th next year, but I know for some people they'll have to plan and travel. It's down at Chichester. It's uh, the University of Chichester who are organizing this. And um, I've been asked to contribute to the symposium on coaching psychology. And what I'm going to be doing, and listeners will be really familiar with this, but what I'm going to be doing is talking a little bit about the role that overcoming psychological discomfort plays in coaching. So how does it show up? What is psychological discomfort? What are some of the ways that we can help our coaching clients overcome it to do more of the stuff that really matters? And um, what I'm really delighted about uh, is the list of other people presenting at this. I'm so looking forward to it. Uh, I'm not a big fan of people who speak at a conference, they, you know, arrive, do their bit and leave. But sometimes logistics make that a bit tricky. I'm going for the entire day because I want to hear every single presentation. It looks really good. So I'll put a link in the show notes to that if people are interested. And no doubt, we'll either have some podcast content or we can have a conversation about it uh, next April when I return. Now, on that note, coaching um, and working as a coaching psychologist, I do get a lot of questions about that. And this time of year, there's a lot of social elements to life and invariably we talk about work. And I get really frequently asked questions. You know, they're the sort of similar questions all the time. So I was inspired on a trip last week when I was going to Dublin for business to start a new series over on the YouTube channel, a new kind of vlog series, just me answering some of these questions and talking about what it's like to actually work as a coaching psychologist. So it's the first of a few. You can find it over on uh, worklifepsych.tv, uh, vlog number one. It's a really great name for it, but in future, <laughs> there will be better names. And really what I want to do is do this really quite frequently and answer those questions that viewers have. So worklifepsych.tv for that. I wanted to share a story I came across possibly 10 days, two weeks ago, that really caught my eye in the press. It was in the Guardian newspaper, and it was about a, a city in Sweden. Um, I had to look this up, had to pronounce this, and I am going to butcher it to all Swedish speakers, because I know we have some Swedish listeners. Oh. Luleå, 
uh, is the name of this city. And um, they've started a campaign to combat loneliness because of the long winter and the, the, the darkness that comes from being that far north and the risk of isolation when people are maybe spending more time indoors or they're rushing to get from place to place and they're really you know, head down. And the observation was post-COVID, people weren't really connecting the, the way that they used to. So they started a campaign to encourage people just to say hello to each other in public. Not people you know, but the people you don't know. I thought it was a really nice story and a really good illustration of the benefits of just saying hi to people where it might result in a conversation or it might just help someone feel a bit more connected to their community. For some, it might be the only exchange they have with another human being that day. So I thought that was really, really nice. And of course, it reminded me of our own campaign against workplace loneliness. So if that's a topic you're interested in, I'll put the link to the article in the show notes, but I'll also link to our Connect and Thrive campaign, um, which um, on worklifesock.com slash connect and thrive, you can find a whole bunch of resources for free about loneliness and how to, to beat loneliness in the workplace. It's still a big topic. It's still a big issue, um, but it's nice to seeing it being discussed more and more uh, in the press, maybe working against a little bit of that, um, that difficulty in even discussing it. And um, finally, um, our new newsletter, the December newsletter is live. Uh, if you haven't signed up for that, you can uh, either sign up or if you just don't want another thing arriving in your inbox every month, and I completely understand, you can read it online at worklifepsych.news. That's all the news, quite a bit this time. <laughs> Lots of news for the end of the year. <laughs> I know, I know. Great. So here we are, uh, episode 150, and I had to look this up, but our very first episode of this podcast went live on October 18th, 2017. That's that's quite a long time ago. It, yes. feels, it feels like a very long time ago. Uh, a lot has happened since then, yeah. and not just with the podcast. It's a very yeah. different world now, but um, I still remember that very first episode recording, which I... Even today, with a lot of self-compassion, I don't consider that an episode. I just <laughs> read a script verbatim and <laughs> pressed end and then just breathed a huge sigh of relief that it was over. It was quite a stressful um, situation. So that's one big thing that's changed. Mm. You know, very little anxiety about sitting down here and chatting with you. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a, that's a really big change over the last 150 episodes. So what I thought we might start with in our review of this is to chat a little bit about what we've learned about uh, podcasting and communicating with an audience in general. For me, it's everything. <laughs> <laughs> I've learned everything because I was starting from zero and yeah. I learned an absolute ton from you. Uh, so before I hear from you, Pilar, I would really like to just share with everyone my huge thanks to you uh, oh. for being a co-pilot on so many of these episodes, keeping me on the straight and narrow, oh. <laughs> giving me really helpful feedback, giving me <laughs> insights into the, the podcasting uh, process and just helping me up the game mm. of the whole thing. It's been a real pleasure. So thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you. I'm enjoying, I love just turning up <laughs> and being here, <laughs> and like you say, and just telling you what I think. <laughs> No, it's great. It's great fun. I, I, I've learned a lot about psychology as well. So yeah, that's good. That's interesting. I'm learning about podcasting. You're mm. learning about psychology. I mean, mm. the reason it exists is to help people learn. So mm. I guess we've got two happy customers to yes, begin already. with. Dick. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I will maybe start the ball rolling by saying the one, th one big thing I've learned is that there's no such thing really as an overnight success, um, that you don't become a master of any skill quickly mm. and that you don't really get a return on the investment of effort for quite some time. And it echoed with my own work around habit formation for uh, for, for good reasons. You, you don't get results from habits very quickly. And so it's important to focus on just being consistent with it. So with the podcast, it's just um, showing up regularly. Yeah. And then one day you realize, oh, people are actually listening to this or, oh, people are emailing in their questions but it, it doesn't happen overnight. Nothing valuable happens overnight. So consistency has been a big takeaway for me. Yeah, and also I think with podcasting in particular, where you are creating something but not getting immediate feedback, it's not like a live show as well. 
and it takes it it really pays off once you've got a body of work because then people listen to your latest episode and they go oh I wonder what this person what else they have and then your downloads go up because people are looking at what you did a year ago two years ago sometimes or more mm. So I think from that point of view as well, it takes a really long time for you to feel connected. And also, I don't know, as a podcast listener, I rarely get in touch with podcasters, even shows that I've been listening to for years because mm. of how we listen to podcasts. We're usually on the move. We're not. And, and so even so even that takes longer than maybe, I don't know, in a live show or presentations or some mm. other, other form. So yeah, definitely focusing on keeping there and like you said and in learning through the process for yourself i think that's really key a key motivator absolutely and i think you make a really good point that we're we're kind of broadcasting to an audience and i mean i've had what i thought were great ideas for topics that bombed yes. and then <laughs> just really casual chats seem to have just gone down yeah. really well so i've given up predicting what I think is going to resonate. And a call out to our listeners, if there's something you want to hear more of, let us know, because then yeah. we can do more of it. And it's less like throwing a dart at the dartboard <laughs> and it's more we're meeting your needs. So, so do get in touch. You can email us at podcast at worklifepsych.com with your feedback, your suggestions, your complaints, or anything that you think, yeah, that was good. I'd like more of that, please. Yeah, yeah. What else? Well, I was thinking, and this might, go into the the next you know when we talk more about the episodes but i think that what still makes it fun for me is the personal aspect of when what we talk about and i think that is something that for me is becoming even more important for podcasting is that you you've got to share what it's like to be you <laughs> and I mean, in this show, especially because it's about psychology, so it really, it, it, for me, it just lifts everything when, when we talk about our own experiences. Maybe for listeners, it would be more or less engaging, but I think also it, it, it I really enjoy that aspect, and I think we've been doing that a lot more lately. Mm. Especially for <laughs> I'm hearing about you, and I love it because I'm so nosy. <laughs> <laughs> But I think that that is also part of the podcasting journey as well, is that you start with facts, information, trying, like you say, to, to see what do people want to hear. And then eventually you realize that you are a great resource as a podcaster, even from your topic and as a connector. So I've, I've, I've noticed that. And I, I mean, I really like it. That's a, a preference. And, and even the cover art, which you've changed to have your photo on it. And I think I, I think it looks great. <laughs> it's very nicely designed, actually. Oh, it works thank very you. well. Yeah. <laughs> thank so you. That as well. I think it's just an em embracing that there, there is the, the podcast host is not just a voice, but a full rounded person. So, yeah. This is it. If I reflect on the things I really enjoy listening to, regardless of the topic, it's because there are people with opinions sharing their views, but also their skills, their knowledge, but you know what they think about it. They're not yeah. just reading the news, you know, and you can get that anywhere. So I, I would agree. I think there has definitely been a journey of tentative, <laughs> these are the facts, into yes. here's what we think about them or here's how we experience them ourselves. Because absolutely, you know, when we when we spoke about that, that topic of uh, do you practice what you preach, this whole point of, you know, you don't have to be able to do all this stuff to know it. And in fact, each of us as humans have strengths and development areas that differ. So we're going to find some of this really challenging as well. And I think that resonates with people better than presenting it as we are superhumans yes. who, who do all of this or pretending we don't have a view at all. It yeah, we're not neutral or else we wouldn't be podcasting. Let's face it, <laughs> it's too much hard work to stay neutral. <laughs> we have views and many yes, of them. <laughs> yes. Well, one thing I've learned from you, because, you know, I do my podcasts are usually quite long form. <laughs> they go all over the place, you know, whether I'm thinking by myself or with someone else. But something I, I really um, enjoyed is the, well, two things. One is chunking a topic so that we sp we look at one specific aspect of it mm. and then sometimes creating either a seven episode series in the case of productivity some while ago or a, a shorter three episode little series about a topic but that's that's helped me actually in some in some of the approach to my work as well and uh, and i think yeah that that's also been interesting that mm. evolution 
I I think it's a a nice way of approaching things. My idea for doing more of that, for chunking things up into separate episodes, was if the content, if the idea you're trying to share is valuable, you don't want part of that idea to be at the end of a long episode that people never get to. Yeah, you know, mm. and not everyone can sit and listen for two hours to something or not everyone um it, it has the focus or, or not everyone will you know stick with that when there's another new episode from something else they want to, to, to listen yeah. to so having shorter episodes that really focus um i think it's what i'd like to do more of yeah for sure and then but it also allows people to look at the listing and go no i don't want to listen to that one i know what it's about but i will listen to that one if if it is what the the title says i will listen to that yeah. one Hmm, yeah. yeah, good. That's a really good observation. Hmm. So when we think about all of the the content <laughs> that we've shared in the episodes, any standout favorites or particular topics or, or guests that you'd like to call out? Well, it won't surprise you that all the personal ones are my favorite. <laughs> so the, well, episode 144, can you take a personal retreat where I was basically just asking you how you'd done it and why and, and all of that. And the, I loved hearing about the process, what was going on in your mind. And similarly, the reflections on your four day week mm. as well. That's episode one, two, three. Oh, one, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> so those those are those are my favorite and then guests i don't have any favorite i like it it depends on the themes like some topics as listener i warm more to than than others and but i enjoy having well just again it's for me it's about the depth that of a topic that two people can go into um so yeah it's, it's so that's really i think that that helps a lot, my understanding of of the broad range of psychological topics, uh, the the two experts talking, and it's good. What I really like as well is, and I find that in most shows that I enjoyed when the host is also an expert of the broader topic, and then you bring in someone who can narrow it down. But it means that there's you're getting insight from two people, not just the guest, and I think that 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 works for me. I really enjoy um, having variety in the guests and it, and you, you notice that in, in, in the tone and you also notice it in, in the, the downloads uh, in part, because I think guests then also promote it as well. Yeah. Look, I was on this podcast, but it, it does seem to resonate uh, with people. And so let me pause for a minute then to also thank all of the guests who've appeared on my pocket sack over the last 150 episodes because they're giving up their time they're uh, they're working to you know share and be uh, as good as they can be and it's been an absolute delight everyone that's that's joined me has has added something and um i love talking to other practitioners but to have a record of that to be able to direct people to and say you can find out much more from that person or even to direct listeners to their research or their book or or whatever it is it it is a, a bit of a treasure trove so big thanks to them um when i was thinking about this i thought that two episodes for me um really stood out one was the connect and thrive episode discussing loneliness one because it's a difficult topic and and I also know that it resonated with with listeners but it, it really allowed us to sort of um, flag this and say it's something that needs attention and also promote the resources and let people know there are things that you can do about this and there are evidence-based ways that you can address this so for me that was a bit of a personal mission rather than a, an interesting topic so I was really happy to be able to do that and then for very different reasons, episode 136, the very next episode, uh, exploring values and goals. Um, for one reason, it's a conversation I have with virtually every coaching client because we end up trying to um, explore the space between the two. So to give that some depth and attention was great because you, you mentioned a catalog earlier to be able to say, look, we've had a, a chat about this, but there's a whole episode you could listen to. Um, in your own time. And that's a real resource. And that's one of the reasons I started the podcast, to have a library to point clients to, to say, you can learn more about this there. And that's one that I think people have uh, really enjoyed and found useful because these are concepts that not everyone 
thinks about, um, but it's important uh, for your personal de um, development to understand the difference between values and goals. So just very selfishly, <laughs> it was useful to have an episode about it. Well, it is. And the the reason why the podcast is such a great resource as well is that you can, like we were saying, you can go into quite a lot of depth in a very short amount of time. And it's it just, it's yeah, it's a really good way to expand your knowledge if you're interested in something. And it's great to be able to point people to, again, to your views on something, not just, hey, someone else wrote this book. No, we did an episode on this. So it makes sense. Makes yep, sense. Absolutely. Now that's our view. Yes. Let's, let's see what <laughs> listeners actually yeah. thought. Um, and again, I'd really encourage listeners uh, to get in touch with us to let us know. Now, if you're in the middle of a run while you're listening to this, because I know a lot, lot of listeners listen while uh, doing something yeah. else. So, you know, don't stop what you're doing. Um, but do, do think about on the back of this episode, what would you like more of, less of? What changes would you like? Get in touch on the socials or uh, email us at podcast at worklifepsych.com. What I've done is have a look at the stats, the very basic download numbers for the last year. And I thought we'd do a top five yes. of what seems to have been popular. So coming in, and this is very top of the pops, coming <laughs> in at number five, uh, a really evergreen topic, uh, episode 137, having difficult conversations. Um, I think framing it like that, and I think the conversation uh, illustrated not just the importance of conversation, but how we could all do a little bit more to move towards having those conversations that matter. Because having done a lot of work on that topic over the last two years with my clients um, in training and coaching environments, I think virtually everybody can identify with, I didn't have that conversation because I anticipated it would be difficult. For some people, it's a lot more than others, but it's a very human experience. So I thought that was one of the reasons I definitely want to, to record that episode. And it, it definitely seems to have resonated with the audience. And what I'm noticing is that it really has resonated because it's quite a new episode, but it has a lot of downloads already compared to some of the other ones, which are a bit older. So that one's going to definitely be mm. top for a while. Yeah. Wow. I, and I, it, it is one that is downloaded virtually every week. You know, mm -hmm. people are going back to that, to episode 137. Coming in at number four was my rant, um, <laughs> episode 131, where we were busting some coaching myths. I think this was one of my favorite episodes to record because it enabled me to just say, this isn't coaching, this isn't coaching, mm -hmm. this isn't coaching, or just, you know, illustrate some of the really common misunderstandings. Yeah. I hope it wasn't too ranty, but I, I do know as soon as I finished that, I sort of breathed out and went, <laughs> oh, I got that all off my chest. Um, and again, it seems to have resonated. People yeah. are downloading that a lot. And I think it illustrates something we've spoken about a few times, that coaching isn't as simple as we might think. And there are so many different views and so many misunderstandings. People are looking for a bit of clarity. So that's not the last time we'll talk about that, I am sure, but it seems to have gone down well. Uh, number three in our top five was episode 127, uh, where we explored a very specific element of thinking, thinking about the future. Are you planning, predicting, or playwriting? And I recorded this, or I, I popped this into our list of topics on the back of using this um, mnemonic planning predicting or playwriting yeah. uh, several times in workshops about thinking skills. And it seemed to really resonate with the group. So I thought this is worth exploring. Given that we think about the future so much, it's beneficial to plan for sure. It's not that helpful to predict. And it's a real waste of our time and energy if we get stuck into playwriting scenarios mm -hmm. in our minds that will never happen. My thought is that because it's such a generalizable human experience, people went, yes, me too. And I'm glad I'm not the only one who does that. <laughs> yeah, it's a great title. And uh, and yes, it is very easy to connect with as well you know, with mm. the content. Number two in our top five, First Steps in Mindfulness, episode one, two, six. Again, I think any mention of mindfulness will mm. attract a lot of interest. I'm also aware some people would just not listen to it just because of that word. And what we're trying to do there is demystify it, talk about the evidence and talk about how you can cultivate a mindfulness practice, a very small accessible one, 
those first steps rather than uh, maybe how it's misrepresented or misunderstood uh, in general. Last week in Dublin, I had a great chat with an attendee at the workshop I was running um, talking about the overlap between the ACT perspective I was bringing to the, the team development session and her own experience of being a yoga trainer. Mm -hmm. And this mindful focus and awareness and intentionality. And we, we we both had a chat about mindfulness is a word that can set off yeah. alarm bells or, or generate a lot of interest. But mm -hmm. I, I found that really, really interesting. And I think I think listeners uh, did as well. Again, we'll come back to it because whether you call it mindfulness or just being present or bringing your awareness to the present moment, I frequently argue that Virtually everything else that we're talking about on this podcast won't be done as well if you are not mindful of the present moment. That that focus on the present moment, that awareness allows you to spot the options in front of you rather than have all of that automatic behavior, that, yeah. that automatic pilot stuff. So we will come back to that whether we use that word or not. Number one. And I can sense her smile from here. Oh. Uh, episode 130, Act in Practice with Dr. Rachel Skews, friend of the podcast. Rachel's been on several times and she's a good friend of mine. Uh, that was the most popular episode of this year. And we really just had a chat there uh, about what it means to put acceptance and commitment theory into practice in coaching situations. I'm not surprised at all that was the number one uh, episode this year. Rachel is a speaker who's very much in demand. So I think when people know she's going to contribute to something, they want to listen to it. So big thanks to Rachel. Um, and I look forward to having her back on the podcast very soon. And also I imagine there's not many conversations about ACT in the podcast space. I mean, I know there's lots of psychology podcasts, but it's, I also feel, and also between friends, <laughs> it's good, which always adds something to the podcast experience. So I'm also not surprised apart from, from Rachel's profile. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree. Um, there are a lot of podcasts about ACT, but they're generally aimed at other practitioners. So they can be a little bit technical or a little bit uh, demanding. Mm -hmm. I will recommend Ross McIntosh's People Soup podcast. Yeah which is act infused, if not made of act. It's brilliant. <laughs> it's a lovely listen. Ross is on the podcast, this podcast very soon. I was on his podcast very um, short time ago. It's act, act, act. It's great. And for, for anyone who wants to know more about bringing it to life, uh, I just love listening to it. He has the nicest voice and the nicest approach. So people soup, I'll put a link in the show notes. So um, we've reviewed our experience of podcasting. Um, this time of year, we're recording at the beginning of December. The episode will be out in a few days' time. Um, I suppose two things I raise at this time of year that there's a bit of a risk uh, for us as humans to do. One is buy into all of the 2024 messaging and kind of wish away the rest of the year. I want to start the new year. Um, and also uh, be too demanding of ourselves um, and get all caught up with it. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. So I would say, look, there's a good chunk of the month left. Anything is possible. And also, actually, the importance of being authentic in your planning for the year. And without jumping into the new year, it's really beneficial to think about the year that's gone by or almost totally gone by because we can learn a lot from that, whether or not it was a a standard year for you or not, before making plans for next year, it's a really good idea to look back. So we'll spend a little time in this episode looking at the benefits of reflection uh, so that we can infuse uh, our plans for the year ahead with that learning, with that increased self-awareness, with that realism uh, that can sometimes get lost in the excitement of New Year's planning. How does that sound? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> I suppose I'd make it a bit of a downer point to begin with. Reviewing your year is going to be made much easier if you've had reviews along the way. If you haven't reflected about how your weeks and months are going, you will, to a large extent, be relying on your memory. 
to help you with this. And we know how fallible our memory is or how it can be swayed by uh, emotional events. So what might stand out for you? Let's imagine you've not done any reflection this year. It shouldn't stop you from trying to reflect. But at the same time, you might remember the big ticket events. That's fine. Maybe have a look at your diary, your calendar, and look back and see what you were spending your time on, what you had to do. Um, look at the spread of events and what kind of events. How were you planning to spend your time, even if it didn't work out that way? Uh, if you've maintained a diary, go go and have a look at that. Maybe talk to other people and get some feedback or reminders about what actually happened, all of which is to overcome the very delicate nature of our memory and how it can be quite selective. So it shouldn't stop you, but you might have to do uh, your reflections in, in a little bit of a, a different way. So what could we use uh, to prompt our reflections? Um, it's not a good idea, I would argue, to score the year. It's a very binary, was it a good year or a bad year? But instead actually try and get a little bit of, not artificial balance, but look at it from a few different perspectives. So we could start with, what went well this year? What were the things that were standout pluses, positives? Now, these don't have to be major achievements or wonderful things, but maybe the, the little successes we experienced along the way, maybe you cultivated a habit and you're really proud of how that's uh, stuck with you. Maybe you overcame a challenge and you're really happy with how you managed to do that. So don't necessarily think that nothing went well because you haven't got a certificate to show or you didn't win the lottery. Most people don't. But if we think about it, we can identify some of the things that went well. The reason I start with this is that we can start to look at, well, why do I think that was positive? Um, what role did I play? in that success or that win. And, and also um, it can help us uh, be grateful for the smaller things as well as the larger things. And gratitude can often be about overcoming difficulties or being grateful that it wasn't as bad as we predicted it was going to be. And looking for a few of these, you know, what went well, um, there are so many things you can, you can add to that list, which brings me to the point you don't need to review your year in one go, you might like to take the remainder of December to go through these points slowly so that you've got lots to work with. So what went well is a really good way to start your review. You might also choose from that, well, if that was good, how can I have more of that? If that was something I really valued or I felt positive about or I feel was worthwhile, I can take that and build that into my my plan for um, the changes I want to make in the new year. Now, the opposite, obviously, we need to look at what didn't go so well. This is not to beat ourselves up. This could also highlight, well, it didn't go well, but I'm pleased with how I handled it, or it didn't go well, but that was out of my control. You know, remember when we spoke about having to revisit our goals because of external forces, there might be disappointments that we didn't reach a goal or we didn't manage to, to do something we planned to do. How much of that was in your control? How much of it was outside forces? This is not to give up responsibility, but to be realistic. And also, if it didn't go well, do I want to aim for that again? Or are there changes I can make that will minimize the chance of having that again? Or do I just accept that this is external forces and I don't need to feel bad about it. I could feel some disappointment, but that's different to blaming myself and having lots of regrets about it. So again, what went well, what didn't go so well, we want to learn from both of those reflective points. Maybe put some things to bed, maybe accept them and have some pointers for what we want to do uh, next year. A question I ask coaches um, a lot is about how, uh, to, to what extent are they putting their values into action? And that could be revisiting some of the points you've just identified. Well, the reason that that went well was because I used my values to guide my decision-making or that went really badly and I used my values to help me keep going. Or I um, started this habit and it was a values aligned habit, or I gave up this bad habit, whatever it is, but this is about making that connection with what matters to you. And of course, if you've never thought about your values before, this is a really great time to spend some time clarifying 
what those are, what really matters to you as a person. Because as we'll see, if you put values at the heart of your plans for next year, they're much more likely to come about. They're much more likely to be authentic and they're much more likely to really matter to you uh, as a person. If you've been reflecting throughout the year, knowing how you've put your values into, into action should be pretty clear. But if you think about your successes, the things you're really proud of, and the, the times when it was really tough, there might be some good examples in there as well. How do these questions sound so far, Pilar? Any, any reflections? Yes, I have one big reflection. <laughs> uh, and it was more than one of the questions. This was, it was something you said about when something didn't go as we wanted it to, or it didn't go well, the difference between being disappointed and feeling like it was that you could have done something different. So basically the difference between being disappointed about something and beating yourself up because mm. thinking of something you did, I think that's really, I've, I've learned to, to separate those and it's very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's important, you know, this is a topic we're going to come back to um, soon about understanding more about what we're feeling and learning to cultivate emotional literacy so that we can discriminate between these feelings and use them effectively. Uh, another one that comes up a lot is understanding the difference between guilt and remorse. You know, with remorse, we, we, we know we've, we've done something uh, unhelpful or bad, but we want to make good on it. And guilt is just an internal continual beating ourselves up and very little action comes from that. So it can be really useful to think about these things and look for the learning in each of them. And, and no matter how small as well, these aren't always the big ticket things. A, a really useful question um, is about what you've learned this year. And what have you learned about yourself? What have you learned about the world uh, more generally? When you've learned about yourself, you might identify capacities you didn't think you had, or you've learned about how you learn skills, or maybe you've learned that you're more resilient than you thought you might be, or that actually... Um, You've learned about some of your development areas, but learning about you is core to what we're doing here. But what is it? What have you realized about yourself? And what have you learned about the world around you? That can help you maybe adjust your expectations. Maybe you've learned that, you know, not everything goes to plan. Things happen, you know, events get in the way. And sometimes our expectations are unrealistic about what's possible. So this is a key reflection, I would suggest, before setting goals or having a plan for the year, because the more realistic we can be about that, not just about our own capabilities, but the world that we live in, the more likely that we're going to be able to attain those goals. And not all of those learning points are going to feel good. <laughs> not all of them are going to make us feel proud of ourselves, but it's really useful to be honest with ourselves so that we can note, yeah, I've learned that about me. Um, when talking about this with clients in workshops, I always note I've learned over the years, um, my attraction to novelty can get me into all kinds of problems because I sign up to too many things at the same time. So it's useful and it helps me scale back my ambitions so that I'm more likely to finish things and not just start lots of new things. So it, it can be as simple as that. And then when you think about the year gone by, what approaches really helped you get those wins or those successes? How did you set yourself up for success? Were they strategies you read about or you learned about online or did you just figure them out for yourself? These could be the simplest things. Like if you're proud with how you built the habit of getting exercise, maybe you realized that putting out your gym kit the night before was something that just really helped you remember to go and be prepared or you made a change at work and you realized that how you started your day your habits in the morning they really helped you begin your day positively but what were the approaches what were the strategies it may be that you can replicate them or that you can look at the magic ingredients in them and generalize from them for the year ahead these are your tool the the, the tools in your toolkit so when you know what those tools are how would you like to use them uh, in the year ahead and then what is it you want to do? You know, I mentioned that um, we, we don't, I don't think it's possible for every year to be your best year yet. <laughs> you know, we've learned what? that over the last few <laughs> years. Um, but what kind of year do you want it to be? We can anticipate and plan, you know, knowing what we know so far about the year. Is it going to be a year of stability or change? 
Is it going to be a year when we want to instigate change? Is it going to be a year where, you know what, I achieved a lot this year. I just want to have a stable year. Or I fell behind in my plans and now I want to really move things forward. Or this is a year that I know um, is going to involve lots of changes for the people around me and my family maybe. And I don't want to add to that. But it's thinking in those, those general terms, remembering what's in your control, what are the kinds of changes you would like to make. And for many people, again, this is a topic we're going to turn to in just a few episodes. It's about being sustainable, you know, identifying a way that they can be sustainably healthy, um, sustainably productive, to have a more sustainable impact on the earth. Um, whatever it is, it's not about more. It's definitely not about more. And it maybe is about scaling things back so that they are clearer, more intentional, uh, but there's less of it. Does that distinction make sense? And does it resonate oh, yes. with you? Yes. Well, the, the not necessarily doing more just to, yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> mm. And listeners may remember we, we recorded an episode all about why you're not reaching your goals. Um, slightly funny story about that. Um, uh, someone in my social circle discovered I had a podcast around about the time that was published and we were out and, and he said, Oh, let me have a look. Let me have a look. And it was the first episode he saw why you're not reaching your goals. I don't want to listen to that. I know why I'm not reaching my goals, but it was to really illustrate what are the common reasons so you can work around them and actually having overly stretching, overly demanding goals when we're caught up in the excitement of goal setting is one of the main reasons. So it might be a good place to start for everyone. How could I do less, but do it better? Or how could I do it less, but enjoy it more? Yes. The enjoyment factor. I think that that sometimes that kind of focus in the planning. It's always about, oh, how can I reach my goals? How can I do more of this? How can I advance my career? But actually, for me, it's always like, okay, how can I just be, for me, it is more about how how can I just be more relaxed? <laughs> mm. What is it? How can I make sure that I've got enough time to enjoy what I'm mm. doing? And often it's, okay, well, then I can't do this, this, and this. <laughs> Or else it's just so much. It's all fun, but it's too much. So no enjoyment. And I think that factor is, for me, that's important. It's a little bit like the difference between, well, I'm looking at my calendar on screen and it's possible to put all these things in, but that's not the same as experiencing all these things. Yeah. And so it's possible. I mean, this is the time of year when people are selling gold setting resources. You know, the, the, here's a journal or a gold setting sheet you can buy and download. And, and it's great to have structure and it really helps people. But at the same time, my observation with these over the years has always been, here's when you can write down your 10 goals. I'm like, why, why do you need 10? You know, you could <laughs> you can have one goal and you can achieve it and then you can do something else. It's not a bad do it all. It's not yeah. about do more. It could be maintain. And I think that's a really important uh, perspective to bring when a lot of the world is getting caught up with that. 2024 is going to be magnificent. <laughs> this is a resigned sigh. Yes, yes. So when you're doing this, and obviously you can reflect in any way that benefits you, and you could involve others as well. You might want to do this with your spouse or with someone, you know, someone close to you in your life, someone that you're going to be spending a lot of time with, you know, in the year ahead. So if you're going to be interdependent with someone, whether it's personally or professionally, it, it can be really useful to talk this stuff through. But from a principal's point of view, I would argue being honest is the only way that you're going to get a benefit from your reflections. So it's not like your reflections are going to be on the news <laughs> or LinkedIn. This is for you. It's not public. And if you're honest with yourself, then you'll get a lot more value from this exercise. And it, to echo an earlier point, one of the things that we can really help ourselves with is to approach it with a sense of curiosity and not blame or judgment. So when we judge ourselves or others, it shuts down the conversation, it shuts down the thinking and exploration. But if we're curious, you know, I didn't attain that goal. I wonder why. What were the factors that got in the way? I wonder why I chose that goal in the first place. I wonder what I can learn from that experience. So being curious helps us learn more. Being judgmental 
uh, leads to uh, self-blame, recrimination, and all of that stuff that's not very helpful. And of course, if you're ashamed, it's really not going to help uh, you grow or change or even want to do this again. If you feel ashamed, then you never want to look at this piece of paper again or this document or whatever it is. So I think everyone, if they sit down and they do this kind of exercise, they can then pat themselves on the back that they've done something really beneficial that's not always comfortable, but gives them the uh, raw ingredients to do, to do something really worthwhile with the year ahead. It can also be useful, although not everyone likes doing this. When we think about planning, we might think about goals we want to achieve, or we might think about um, new habits. It can be useful to identify a, a theme for the year ahead. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, it can be a little bit like a mantra, a few words that remind you that 2024, I want it to be the year of blah, blah, blah. And what this means is that you've got a, a theme that you can bring yourself back to. One, if you're tempted to uh, set a whole bunch of other goals, well, hold on, they're not part of this theme. That's not how I would like this year to be as much as I can control it. It also reminds you when you're presented with options, but, you know, behavioral options. Well, one of these is going to be aligned much more with my theme of blah, blah, blah. Um, and it, it's easy to remember. It keeps it front of mind. It's almost like your marketing tagline. 2024, the year of blah, blah, blah. Now I'm going to stop saying blah. Or maybe <laughs> what I can do is illustrate it with, um, I picked the same theme for the last couple of years, which was simplicity and focus. And this was my um, plan to strip out complexity, to strip out overcommitment, uh, and to build my um, present moment awareness, to build my intentional mindful focus. And I found it really useful because every time I was tempted to jump into something new, I thought, does that help me simplify things? Or can I do it simply? You know, I don't have to do the whole thing. Maybe I could just dip my toe in rather than going all in on a new thing, which is probably another one of my massive failings. <laughs> Let's just dive all the way in. Well, dip my toe in. So something simple, just a few words that you can remind yourself of. This was my intention for the year. Now, it's not a rule that's not helpful. And you could always change it if the world around you changes. But it's a way of having a tone, a theme for the year, a touchstone. And you might find that useful um, before you set your goals, before you identify changes you would like to make uh, in a detailed way, reminding yourself, this is the kind of year I would like to have. What do you think about setting a theme, Pilar? Yeah, I, I did that this year that we're finishing this mm -hmm. was my my theme was sabbatical <laughs> brilliant a sabbatical mindset and and it did help it did help to not hurry because i just wanted to it, i wanted it to be a time where i could give myself time to think about doing things that i didn't have to continue doing so i could explore whether i liked doing them or not and how they felt without the pressure of having to make them work so mm. that was very useful just to remind myself, no, this is the year for doing this. So I can see how, especially if, especially if, if you are either a person for whom lots of opportunities come your way externally or you create them internally, I think that having a theme can just remind you, again, what, is, what you want to be doing or not. It's just a nice way to, to help you make choices. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, yeah, keeping it simple, returning to that point. This is the whole idea of having something like that. And it, again, it's not a rule you're obliged to follow. Life might take a different path or opportunities might come your way, but it's an intention. It's providing a sense of direction. And obviously you can um, align that with what's important to you, your values. And then as you're setting a goal or maybe more than one goal, you, your question is, how does this align with that? Is that something that I genuinely really want to build into my life? And that's a really nice starting point. Now, what, what's really important with um, a retrospective, a review of the year gone by is that building this as a habit means that you have other years to go back and look at. And then you can ask yourself, well, that's what I identified. What are the themes coming out with? When I do look back, what are the things I tend to notice, pay attention to? Can I broaden my vision on this? And 
Do my predictions in any shape that they take, do my plans, do they manifest in the way that I was hoping they would? Or is there optimism that's unhelpful there? Or is there pessimism? Or uh, am I able to, to adapt when things change around me? So while this is an annual event, I really encourage people and um, we have an episode about this, which I'll drop into the show notes, to really look at this on a weekly basis. It doesn't need to take hours, but to jot down your key takeaways from each week, allow you to learn from the week, prepare for the next week, and build up uh, knowledge about yourself and how you're getting on across the year so that you don't have this um, cliff edge end of the year, and then a magical fresh start with no sense of realism, whereas I actually I'm the same person I was on the 31st of December, but I have the added benefit of increased self-knowledge and self-awareness and more realism so that when I do start this new year, I'm bringing that with me. I'm not leaving everything behind and pretending I can be a whole different person. So the review, I would love to hear from you. When you do this, uh, listeners, if you have identified questions that are really beneficial for you, that spark ideas and further reflection, uh, we don't need to know all the details, but if you found it useful and there's something you want to share, let us know. And if it's helped you with things like your, your goal setting or even just clarifying an intention for the year ahead, what's your theme? I'd love to know what kinds of themes you're coming up with. I think uh, given the time we're at, given everything that we've covered today, it's probably a good time to wrap this episode up, Pilar. Any final thoughts to throw into the mix? Just a happy 150 again, and uh, well done for also learning from all of it. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> thank you for sharing what you've learned through that, because the, the more than a year, it spanned a few years. So yeah, mm. that's, that's, that's all from me. So I would like to finish with a couple of thank yous. Thank you to uh, Ross Winter, who polishes our recordings to make them easier on your ears. He's able to do magical things with the sound quality. And of course, to thank our listeners. You come back every episode, you listen, you do get in touch, and very occasionally you stop me in the street, which is a very strange experience. Um <laughs> very strange. Uh, and if I've bristled when you've done that, I do apologize. But, you know, living in London and a stranger stops you, your first thought is not a positive one. So, uh, but if you see me, if you recognize this head, this face in the crowd, do say hi. Uh, but please um, keep going. Let us know how we could make it an even better experience for you. And it wouldn't be 150 episodes if no one was listening. So thank you so much for bearing with us. Uh, 150 episodes. I feel really good about that. It's been a great start to my day. Thank you, Pilar. I will uh, see you very soon for the next episode. Thank you, everyone, for listening. <laughs>